You're listening to Discography Discussion, episode 204, Living Sacrifice Revisited, hosted by Dan Terry. If this ever showed up on one of the live streams, just know that I'm dead and Joe's deep faking me. John Beatty. What, you mean you're Sony Walkman? And Joseph Wren. What about old pants? Can we dig out the Hot Topic pants with the fucking buckles on the ass? Presented by DiscussMetal.com. And if you think the hammering process is what happens when Dan plays blood and finds the sledgehammer, then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. I am Joe. That is Dan. That is John. You wanted to talk about Living Sacrifice again. I did, man. We talked about Zeo again uh, a few weeks ago. We did it live here on Twitch, and it was a lot of fun. So, uh, you know, this is uh, this is exciting for me because I love talking about this band. I think I think one of the most frustrating aspects of doing this show for me is whenever we listen to something that I genuinely love, like not not just like something I'm checking out for the first time or or something that, um, you know, was suggested for us to talk about. Not that I don't love those bands. I find a lot of really good bands uh, in doing that. So, you know, keep those suggestions coming. But for me a band like living sacrifice or Zayo or, you know, Norma Jean or, or really dying, um, you know, like bands like that, um, that I actually really enjoy listening to their music. And then it's like, no, we, we did that. And then, you know, as time goes on, it's like, no, we talked about living sacrifice two years ago. And I'm like, but I want to do it again because it was so much fun. And, uh, I whined and I cried and I got my way as is often the case. So, uh, here we are talking about living sacrifice except uh i think this is going to be interesting because last time well we didn't have john and and john uh you guys are going to be hearing and seeing a lot more of john um because he is going to be filling in the uh, empty seat of the third co-host and uh, i couldn't think of anybody uh better to um to kind of challenge some of the opinions some of the hot takes that try that again some of the hot takes that happen from time to time on this show <laughs> Yeah, um, as you're going to be introduced on this episode and and the one we're doing next, uh, spoilers, uh, with, and Joe will probably bleep it out so you don't know, but uh, with Entombed, um, I'd never listened to these bands. And chances are, looking at the master list of what we're probably going to do most of this year, that's going to be the case. So uh, you're either going to really enjoy my hot takes on bands I've never listened to and will be talking about for the first time, or you're going to grow to fucking hate me. And that's fine. I have broad shoulders, so grow to hate you. Me. Yeah, I mean, whatever. I don't give a fuck. I mean, our our love hate relationship is my favorite part of our relationship. Yeah, I mean, you know, you think you're always right, and you're not, and that's okay. Welcome to my world. Well, you know, I also don't agree with you either. <laughs> <laughs> Buddy says the hottest of takes. Beatty's gonna be great. <laughs> As he gave me a Corey Taylor mask, I love it. Am I the unsainted one? <laughs> Here's the tortilla man. I don't need nothing. <laughs> Uh, well, um, I guess let's, uh, let's get into Living Sacrifice. That's why everyone's here, right? That is why we're here. Yeah, we are here to talk about the one, the only, the often imitated, never replicated Living Sacrifice. Oh, they're, they're, they duplicate and replicate very well. I mean, they don't replicate. Actually, that's not true. They do replicate. There's like how many bands that are loosely related to Living Sacrifice in some way, shape, or form? Dude, I think that's the hardcore scene, metalcore scene as a whole from back then and and then some. I mean, shit, even the 80s thrash scene kind of does that. We call that the six degrees of Rocky Gray. Oh, okay. Yeah, Rocky Gray's been in like all the bands. Evan, he was, let's see, Evanescence, Project 86, Thy Pain, Soul Embraced, um, other bands that I don't remember the names of. <laughs> Is that the official uh, tab got, on the Wikipedia of him? Is just other bands. I should have done that, but I, I didn't think about it. Uh, Fair enough. I did. I, I think it would. T- I think it would be too big of a labor of somebody to make the Wikipedia page on Rocky Gray, as the guy is just in so many bands and is always doing something. He um, plays all like, the guitars, all the drums. He shows up vocals. on your favorite new album by an artist that crowd funds and decides to put out a new album. Rocky Gray is basically the man when it comes to this scene. I just wish he wasn't so neutral and would just choose either black or white. It don't matter. Well, there's actually 14 <laughs> shades of gray, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. We've, we've labeled all 14 of them. And 13 I, ways I to bleed on that. stage. Mm-hmm. Mm. And the 12 days of Christmas. 
Yeah, I'm running out. I mean, you got Levin, Dan. That's your that's your number now. I think there was a band called Eleven Hours Down. I think uh, there's there's that. Ten Only things I hate band. about you. And then there's then there's ten years. <laughs> yeah, ten years. Yeah. What do we got for nine? Uh, I don't know. Well, before Dan allows this charade to go on, I'm going to take this time to say thank you to everyone for listening to the podcast. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. If you are not a subscriber, then you can find everything Discography Discussion at DiscussMetal.com. We are on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Twitch.tv forward slash Discuss Metal Dan for all your game streaming and live show recording needs. So if you have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home, you have no excuse. Ask it to play the latest episode of the Discography Discussion podcast, and it will. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe. It really helps us out. It lets us know you're listening, and now Dan is going to tell us all about five-star reviews. What else can I say about five-star reviews that I haven't said before? I like reading them. They make me happy. One-star reviews, they make me a little bit sad. So leave us whatever kind of review that matches up with whatever kind of mood you want me to be in. And uh, and we will accept that review, and we will we will read it on the show, unless you don't write anything. Got to write something, right? I mean, if, you're, if, you, if you feel strongly enough to, to, to click on a certain number of stars, then there should, be, there should be something backing up that feeling. So, you know, let us know. How many stars would you like them to click on, Dan? Well, I mean, I would prefer them to click on five stars, but I can't control what people do. So it is what it is. But uh, we seriously, though, we, we appreciate you guys. We appreciate you guys that share the episodes. We appreciate you guys that show up and watch us record the episodes live. Like, that's been incredible. That's been a lot of fun. And so uh, in the spirit of that, um, I just want to thank all of you from the, is it the top or the bottom of my heart? That's the good one. I think it's the bottom. And then the love just rises to the surface. No, there's only one place to go from there. This is an upside-down situation like Stranger Things, so technically it's going to be the dark inside of the heart that's going to be the most positive. That was the point of that show, right? How about all of my heart? All of my heart is what I want. Sorry. I like All of my heart. Yes, Cobra Kai is awesome. Do that new season. So, Dan, tell me about Living Sacrifice. Oh my God, guys! Living Sacrifice is a metal band that started in the late, late, late eighties. Let's just say nineties, because it's not really. I mean, I think they put a demo out in eighty-nine, maybe not yielding to ungodly. I think that's what it was called. I know that's what it was called. I just said I think to make myself sound cooler. Uh, I'm a huge fan of this band. Uh, they've gone through so many different um, styles since they formed that it's really kind of hard to keep track i mean what do we call them do we call them a thrash band do we call them a death metal band do we call them a metalcore band do we call them a groove metal band they've been all of those things i would like to call them a thrash band just out of principle not surprised (laughs) living sacrifice being an interesting case in that they were a christian metal band in the 90s uh which is which is rough uh if you're a christian metal band in the 90s playing extreme metal um, it's not like it was in like 2005 where like you actually got on more shows if you were a Christian metal band. Uh, this was a totally different era. And uh, it's, it's very interesting to see a band uh, talking about Christianity uh, basically becoming a pillar of, of an entire scene. So, I mean, in, in that scene, these guys are they're kind of the band that you look at when you think about when you think about Christian metal and hardcore and all of that stuff. People are always like, yeah, man, you know, bands like Zeo and Living Sacrifice and Embodiment. Like, I mean, if there's a big four of Christian metal, Living Sacrifice is in one of those slots, if not two. They're definitely one of the bands that come up first when you start listening to heavier music in your youth. And you're friends with a guy named Dan, who was almost fully restricted to non-secular music because it was evil don't ask me about what that bleach album really is he might tell that story later on but living sacrifice takes that sound that you're putting up with because you want it to be okay you kind of want to believe that your music is as cool as the stuff that's on the radio all the time but living sacrifice for the most part at least they definitely are and they are legendary not just in that scene, but in metal in general. I see a lot of bands call out Living Sacrifice as a prime influence 
when it comes to heavy guitars and riffs and extreme vocals and melody, because they have that too. They definitely have a very interesting relationship with melodic uh, melodic interludes and passages, and we even get some melodic choruses out of them, which is uh, something that you would think that I would hate, but I actually find them to be sparse enough to be acceptable. This is not... Uh, they don't go full Demon Hunter, because never go full Demon Hunter. <laughs> I legit thought you were going to say they had a special relationship with God. <laughs> they do have a special relationship with God. That's that's the 100% true statement. <laughs> John, what's your history with Living Sacrifice? Uh, none, just like my relationship with God. <laughs> very good, very good. Uh, so, and your relationship with Entombed, right? <laughs> uh, yep. Basically, at this point, uh, just assume that I've not listened to anything we're going to talk about until about, what, April? <laughs> Gonna be I'm a virgin we I'm here, guys. I'm gonna be a virgin until about April. I think I've mapped out. I mean, that sounds about that sounds about right. Yep. yep. Again, I'm can... giving I'm giving so much of my my audio virginity to you guys. Well, we definitely appreciate you. Ha- <laughs> we, re- <laughs> we definitely appreciate having you here, John. So uh, yeah, I mean, Living Sacrifice is the band that you want to check out if you're not sure like what this Christian music thing is all about. And you've heard that there's heavy Christian bands, but you don't really know who to check out. Um, Definitely check out Zayo, but also make sure to check out Living Sacrifice. So let's get into it, boys. 1991. Living. Dan, you want to finish this for me? Sacrifice. It's weird, though, that it's called Living Sacrifice because it's it's Slayer, right? (laughs) Like it... Like it straight up is Slayer. So th- this this first Living Sacrifice record is very interesting to me because I feel like as a new band, and these guys were probably in their teens, late teens, whenever they recorded this. The the biggest thing that you could do, especially in Christian music, was to sound like Believer uh, or you know Tourniquet or you know some of some of those other bands. The the Christian thrash scene that existed prior to Living Sacrifice. Um, the the thrash scene that that existed before uh, Living Sacrifice was more in almost the style of the more extreme uh, '80s bands. Um, so I mean, you had heavier bands, heavier heavier vocals, um, and all of that. Vengeance Rising was really important at the time uh, for having those extreme vocals. Mortification was actually awesome back then uh, for being this like brutal you know death metal band but like those bands i hate to say it they did come across as a lot more original with the exception of deliverance who was basically just metallica um but most of those bands had a very 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 original sound whereas living sacrifice came out of the gate with not being as original but they are notable notable for being one of the only Christian bands that I can think of that actually sounded like Slayer and really tried to move that sound uh, a little bit forward, and, and especially in Christian music. So, I mean, in that regard, the actual music contained on it is actually pretty good uh, for, for thrash metal Slayer-sounding stuff. Like, it's a clone. We've gotten that out of the way, but... I think that the I think that the vocals are good for the time. Uh, I think that the lead guitar work is good for the time. I mean, this is this this is fast paced, breakneck speed stuff. We're not really in we're not really in uh, in blast territory just yet, but we are going to get there eventually with the next record. Um, overall, though, the only complaint I really have about this record is that the solo work is a little well, it's a little bit Slayer. It's a little cat strangly. Uh, for, for lack of a better term, they, they hadn't really, I think, completely mastered the art of writing a good solo is, is a nice way to put it. I don't think that they're I, again, I don't think it's bad. It's better than I can play. But those are not the type of solos that I really enjoy hearing as a music listener. I like I like something that, that kind of go, kind of grooves with the actual riffs. Um, but that's also kind of a nitpick, considering the fact that most of these bands that were playing the Slayer style of thrash metal, I mean, that's what you played. You played Cat Strangler solos. You're, you're literally following your your influence. Um, so to say that it's not good because it's not my preference is doing it a bit of a disservice. It definitely checks the box. And most likely this is just the band getting together for the first time and writing a record that was supposed to be as heavy and intense and as fast-paced as possible. 
So Slayer. Yeah. It's not what I'm expecting when I'm listening to Living Sacrifice. I think they very quickly will change their sound to what they are conventionally known for. But it's not a bad first album. If anything, it sounds thin. Sounds like if I had the cassette, I would really enjoy listening to this on my Walkman portable cassette player or my car. Or in my case, from the passenger seat of Dan's car because Dan always drives back in the day. Well, uh, if you need a cassette tape, Joe, I have one. I've got several copies of the uh, Living Sacrifice self-titled on cassette. So, yeah. Just bring that down next time, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me, man. Um, yeah, I think that this I think that this record is incredible um, for its significance in Christian thrash metal. Um, I think that this this obviously like you, you go to Cornerstone Festival, right? And it's a whole bunch of like it's like this mix of like eighties hair bands and like uh, yeah, because Christian music historically at the time had been. Um, Christian music historically at the time had been more or less uh, a couple of years behind. So like what would have been cool in 98 really probably wasn't as cool in um, typically wasn't as cool anymore. You know, so like 89, 88, 89, but you could go to Cornerstone and see bands that would be playing what was popular a couple of years prior, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So to see a band at Cornerstone that was playing something this heavy and this extreme um, that sounded like Slayer, like aces across the board, especially especially in the U.S. Are we ready for non-existent? Oh, I knew we were going to have to talk about this record. You asked for it. Oh, boy. 1992. Oh boy. So yeah, this is this is a thing they did. The vocals on this album are not very good. Uh, nothing on this record is good. Let's be <laughs> real. <laughs> Whatever. You just steamrolled past my uh, thoughts on the last record, which is fine. All I had to say is really, it just sounds like a thrash metal album of this era but um I, I don't know what the fuck happened to this uh record from a producing standpoint but holy shit is this bad um it's weird though because you you sometimes get glimpses into where what the songs could have been with better production and and, and all of that like you know chemical straight jacket i think could have been a really great song but unfortunately the production on it and just how it was recorded is terrible um, there's even like, you know, that really solid part at the end of uh void of expression and it like, it's really fucking good. But the unfortunate thing is, is it's done no favors when that dog shit solo comes in and you're just like, like, you know, I had a guitar in my hand and then someone's like, Hey, we're punching in for the solo. And you're like, wait, oh, 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 oh shit. And you just, whatever the fuck came out. And that was what ended up on the record. Like someone surprised you. Like you had a guitar in your hand. They're like, hey, solo for whatever. You're like, solo? Oh, all right. What song was that? Doesn't matter. It's going in. You're fine. Um, I know obviously everyone's going to say something about the vocals. I Obviously, they're not great. Um, but with this being the first time I've really listened to the band, um, it does kind of... Con I did kind of have to remind myself, you know, a few times of this is the era of all those great Florida death metal bands and so forth. And, you know, them maybe trying to want to incorporate what they're doing because, you know, something that Dan and I have talked about and Dan and I obviously, and I think like a lot of people grew up completely different. Yeah. So for oh, yeah. me, like I did not, I got to listen to everything, uh, good, bad or indifferent. Don't know how you feel about it, but it's interesting to me when you hear bands like this and for someone like Dan who is you know in a very predominant Christian household and probably has to buy his records at the uh, what were the, the Christian bookstore is that what they were called I think yes um, like you have to uh, you're buying your records there and potentially this has been deemed acceptable by them to be in the store there's no cursing da 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 so you're basically trying to find your quote unquote Christian equivalent to whatever the mainstream is listening to and so what's interesting is trying to think about this band for that demographic, because um, it's definitely not what I like how I grew up. Like I grew up listening, not necessarily to a ton of Slayer, but those thrash bands, you know, your Anthraxes and so forth, your big four. And so to me, when I hear this, I go, ah, oh, it's like they're trying to sound like these bands and just not quite hitting what makes those bands great or made them great so early on. But I feel like you can see the potential for them to grow and become that band within this genre, like this Christian thrash genre. 
Um, could be completely wrong and off base with that, but that's kind of how I felt when listening to Non-Existent is it feels like a band who's trying to find their way within uh, this this thrashing and, and, and how it's kind of growing, uh, especially with all the influences that they can pull from. But it, it's still at this point to me feels like a band that's trying to emulate, not to um, originate. Yeah, and I think that like non-existent, I, I've had such a weird relationship with because I didn't hear it first. You know, okay. the, the album the album that got me into Living Sacrifice was the Hammering Process. Okay, uh, which obviously is a is a hard act to follow. But uh, <laughs> as as I've said in other in other podcasts, I, I did I you know I heard Hammering Process, and then of course there's there's the urge to want everything, right? So by the time I uh, by the time I'd obtained everything. I had no idea what I was really in for. I knew that the first record was going to sound old, and it did, you know, at the time. Because I'm, this is like, you know, early 2000s that I'm hearing it. I'm like, yeah, it's a record from 1990, and it, it, for the most part, it sounded, it sounded to me more like, like par for the course. But non-existent was weird because they went for a totally different atmosphere. You've got, you've got this cover artwork which is just kind of, kind of scary, at least for the time. Uh, it's, it's, it's just. Full of skulls and and um, there's like a superimposed, not superimposed, but like a image of the band that's like a high contrast, like black and white. Um, a lot of bands use that effect on their photos in the '90s, um, and so what they what they're trying to show you is just straight brutality. You know, like we, we we don't want there to be any question with anybody about what kind of band this is. This is death metal. We're 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 gonna just be the legit thing. And you know, I know from people that I've spoken with that that record pissed off so many parents uh, of you know in Christian households, and 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 pissed off a whole bunch of people that were um, it pissed off a whole bunch of people that were really not um, not expect like they just felt like Christian bands were not supposed to cross a certain line, and they felt like they had crossed a line with this. So the record becomes badass just by association, in the sense that it's a little bit more like it's a little bit more edgy. It's like it's like the modern. It's the modern equivalent of if a Christian band says fuck on a record, you know, like it's it, people, you, people are like, oh, you've crossed that line. You know, now you're no longer. Well, they defined the great line and then they crossed it. Right. Uh, <laughs> but like if the, at the time, playing field was level, we're not talking about secular band versus non secular band. Would this version of Living Sacrifice have been signed to a label and gone on tour with other metal bands or would they be another underground band that really just wanted to be part of that scene i think that like they were more of a they they had a little bit of of credibility as far as like because i know that they did tours with like malevolent creation and like some of the some of the bigger uh like death metal bands i know that i know that once they started playing death metal that it kind of opened up a lot of doors for them as far as getting more credibility in the scene. I mean, I think, I think, I think mostly they were probably still doing Christian tours, but um, it is absolutely incredible how how far they got in this earlier incarnation. Because at the time, their music wasn't super original, and I feel like people would have had issues with the with the Christian lyrics and all that. Um, my understanding, though, is that the fans, uh, the, uh, that's that's how the fans acted, but the actual other bands that were like Satanists or whatever were like super, super cool to them and were like, yeah, you're like, you know, we're, we're all just out here making metal. Uh, there was a story that DJ told on the As the Story Grows podcast about how um, the dudes from Malevol- Malevolent Creation, like, were like basically telling people, like, if you mess with these guys, you know, you're messing with us and, you know, like all this stuff. Um, but you know, back on the back on the album itself, um, it's it's badass because of the cover artwork. It's going to upset people, you know, uh, Christian people, you know, and it's also badass enough to look like a um, a re- just a regular metal record, you know, that wouldn't necessarily be in the Christian section of a bookstore and um, or a music store. See, for me, I grew up Christian, so like a lot of you know, it's always the bookstore where you buy music, not the music store. Well, I'm surprised you didn't buy it at a gas station. Well, I, if they would have been available at a gas station, I would have bought it for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so you know, you put this thing on, right? And you've got this creepy, uh, you get this creepy intro uh, that was made by um, by the dude from Circle of Dust, um, who later went on to become Cell Dweller. 
Um, but so like he does this, he does this, um, this creepy intro and it's got like monks chanting and it's, it, it is, it really does create a very dark atmosphere, but man, then when the music starts, it like almost completely takes me out of it because of just how badly recorded it is. Um, it doesn't like, it sounds thin. Like the first living sacrifice album sounds better, uh, than sounds better than non-existent. You know, it sounds beefier. It sounds harder. Uh, this sounds like this record sounds like it was recorded by somebody that did not know how to record heavy music. <laughs> uh, and that's actually true. You can ask anybody in the band and they will tell you a hundred percent that, yeah, this guy had no idea what he was doing and that they had to, they had to kind of step in uh, and do a whole bunch of stuff. So, so, you know, there's that. It's not for the incomplete bad sounding, but it is absolutely not as clear as the previous album. Sounds like a tragedy of circumstance. The guy that they hired to record the record didn't know how to record what Living Sacrifice was playing at that time, and this is what we got. It really does come down to the engineer, especially back then. I think it's interesting, though, looking back on the 90s and looking back on this time frame of Christian music and Christian metal. I'm with John. I listened to everything because everything is cool. If it sounds good, listen to it. But this is the time prior to the internet and prior to the current generation of parents where you relied on that establishment to tell you that the music was okay to listen to. You relied on the sanctuary of those establishments. So you go to the Christian bookstore because you as a parent are expecting them to vet the products for you. It's similar to the argument in the 80s about the parental advisory and the PMRC and all of that stuff just taken to a different place. People that don't have time to listen to every second of these albums just want somebody else to do the work for them. It's interesting to me that the cover of this album is what set everybody off. I would be listening to the content and be more disturbed by the sound of the music than I am by what the cover looks like. Honestly, you're you're right on though. Like that people relied on the establishment to do the like okay, if if this is sold in this store and it's on this label then it's okay for kids to listen to. You know, and that's that's really annoying. Um it's something we've talked about in a lot of interviews with Discuss Metal, you know, bands getting pigeonholed into a certain genre that maybe they didn't necessarily know they were being pigeonholed into. Um but I think Living Sacrifice it was one of those things where it was always a it was always a safe bet with Living Sacrifice because these guys were Christians. They were in it. Uh, they, they were in it to be, you know, a Christian band that people respected and liked. But they also wanted to be very metal. They also wanted to they also wanted to have some level of legitimacy to to their metal. Uh, but as the uh, I, we're I'm sorry I keep going off topic about the record because there's just so much about non-existent. Uh, as to why people like it as much as they do. And I think I think what it really boils down to is that even though the, what's on the record is not really that great as far as the band goes, like they're going to outdo this record immediately. You know, this is going to go, this is going to, it's going to become non-existent. It's going to get shoved under a shelf whenever you start hearing some of their other records. Um, vocals are really not very good. I know DJ was trying to do a different thing. Um, you know, obviously he couldn't do the same vocals that he did on the self-titled, uh, over this like death metal record it had to be deep it had to be you know and I always say that maybe he was just trying to do an obituary thing which in my opinion is a terrible place to start uh, because I the vocals of obituary is terrible um, <laughs> but it is one of those uh, yeah you can check out the obituary episode if you want to hear more about that but I do think that this I do think that this band it didn't really matter what the music sounded like on non-existent I think that they had made a big enough impression on all of those people that they're like, yeah, check out this crazy death metal band. And I would imagine that a lot of Christians at the time probably hadn't heard death metal unless they were already in the know, you know? So like the average parent hears non existent, they're like, oh God, is death, what is this? This is, you know, whatever. Um, and some Christians were hearing, were hearing death metal for the first time from bands like Living Sacrifice and Mortification. Um, so they didn't really have a whole lot to compare it to. So I think that's why a lot of the times people are like, oh, no, 
the vocals on non-existent are sick, you know, or the uh, the solos are sick. It's all, you know, whatever. But I would say for me, the only enjoyment that I really get out of listening to non-existent is I do enjoy those melodic passages that are interspersed throughout the record. I think that adds a lot to the dark atmosphere. And sometimes they even sound a little bit ho- like a little bit hopeful. So, I mean, in that regard, it does give this like light in a dark place. And I think that was the goal. Like 100% was the goal. Are we ready for Inhabit? Um, yeah, let's go to Inhabit. I don't think anyone's ready for Inhabit. 1994 Inhabit. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I pick John. So, <sighs> we can all agree that last record was just dog shit for so many reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was a, I was a lot nicer on it than I was on the first Living Sacrifice episode. We yeah. like really dug into it, but uh, I have since like since we did that episode, I've spoken to DJ a double, number of times, and uh, you know we kind of talked about some of that stuff, and um, so I have a lot more context than I did going in. Whereas originally, I was just like, oh, I don't know, like why would someone do this? You know, like this had to pass a panel of, of people that, uh, you know, all gave it a thumbs up and said it was good in order for it to get released. I mean, sometimes sometimes some of those stories that you have to wonder how much of it is accurate or how much of it has been changed by time and the reaction to, quote unquote, the music or whatever. And someone being like, well, you know, actually, I really didn't like this when we were doing it, but the rest of the guys or the label or whatever, it's easier to kind of do that shit in hindsight. Who knows how someone actually felt uh, in real time? I mean, Dan, you told me a story in, in Messenger when we were talking about this because I was like, what the fuck happened? And you were like, oh, this, this and this. And I was like, mm. if it was more of like, oh, we just didn't want to like work with this dude or we thought if we put out a shitty record that let us put uh, like go back and do it again and put out a yeah. better one. And yeah. I was like, no, a label will never fucking do that. Like, I feel like a label will be like, oh, you're going to do that and waste our fucking money. No, we're putting this out. Now it looks bad on you. Like, don't ever try to fuck a label. Um, I think we've all learned that through everything. That is um, how you get a yeehaw, giddy up, Satan situation. Sure. Um, but it le- talking more specifically about Inhabit, um, this is more a more back to kind of the style of production that makes sense, I think, for this band, this style of band. But we have a slightly more cleaned up attempt and on the vocals uh, than we did, obviously, the last one. For um, sure, yeah. Something that caught me off guard, and I just kind of had to be like, question marks, was, was that an explosion in the middle of the song before the first verse uh, in, oh, yeah. in the shadow? <laughs> like, yes, why? it was an explosion. They added a bunch of stuff like that. There's a lot. There's a lot of like sample enhancements uh, that go on. And I mean, I know that was big in the hardcore scene back then. Like, obviously, like you know, you look at 18 Visions with like the samples they fucking used, and every hardcore band back then. But like, it was just like a. It was like someone almost got like. And this is a really nerdy reference. If anyone watched Friends with Ross with his fucking little keyboard thing, and he's just playing all these like sound effects to make a quote unquote song, I was like, it's almost like that. Like they got a patch of sound effects, and someone was just like, Pfft. and you're like, why? Cause that's why. Um, <laughs> so it's but, Joe with it with his soundboard. Sure. Um, <laughs> I think you know what's what's interesting is as a whole, this record threw me a lot more curveballs uh, from the production. You know that weird murder yell panned hard left on not beneath was kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, the double time parts toward the end of uh, Inhabit kind of made me go back and replay those parts because I thought they were really cool. There was just more on this record for me to kind of grab onto as a listener. Um, uh, as a fan of this style of music more and from, like I said, a production, because I think for me, something that constantly brings me back is is a good songwriting, but also good production tricks where like maybe there's something about a record where you listen to it and you focus on, you know, maybe it's the lyrics or the vocals. And the second time you go through, it's, oh, I'm paying more attention to the music. And then they're doing different stuff on from a production standpoint that kind of keeps bringing you back where you're able to find new things. And I think this is one of the first records for the band from this band where it kind of fires on all cylinders, where the mix is good, the production's good, the songwriting's a lot better, and just every, excuse me, everything is working together to create a a more cohesive, fuller picture of what Living Sacrifice is and is going to be, or can be. Yeah, totally. And uh, Inhabit is is, is a huge improvement for me as far as non from non-existent, because non-existent was 
just not a great record. But I think one of the biggest things about Inhabit is that they're no longer ripping off of anyone. No. This is this is where they actually took the good elements that were present in non-existent and did it better. They did a better job of it. Um, the drumming is absolutely out of this world, insanely better than anything that they'd ever done before. Um, Lance Garvin is insane on this record, just completely on fire. And um, it, it's one of those things where it's almost unbelievable how good it actually is. And then you've got the riffs. The riffs are heavier. This record actually has a punch. It has the guitars have beef. Like it's uh, it, it, it's the real deal. Finally, you know, like after waiting a little bit, you know, for them to kind of figure it out, they absolutely figure it out. Um, and they blow it out of the water. There, there's much more attention paid to the vocals, the delivery. Um, I have to admit, I do think that sometimes the vocals are a little too monotone on this record, but I'll take it over non-existent any any day. You know, like I'll take it, you know, and so in that sense, it's like, yeah. And, you know, again, like heart, like death metal vocals don't have to be good. They have to be there, but they don't have to be good. Um, but they also can't be horrible. It's such a double, double standard. You know, it's an unpleasable metal fan sort of situation where it's like, I want the vocals to be good and super, you know, brutal and in your face. But at the same time, I also... Um, don't really, you know, if if they're super super bad or whatever, I'm gonna yell about it. Like, ladies and there's gentlemen, nothing you can do, right? metal fan. Yeah, I mean, you're you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. You know, um, but I you're think damned that if even, you do and damned if you don't. E- even if you even if you look at like um, e- even if you look at DJ's delivery from the self titled and non existent and inhabit, uh, inhabit, he's trying a lot harder to make some of this stuff make sense. And there is a lot of like production. There's a lot of production help in all of that. Um, there's definitely a little bit of an effect on his voice uh, that enhances it quite a bit. And plus like that, that part of not beneath that you were talking about. I love that. Uh, I love that they added that in there. Is it unnecessary? Absolutely. But you know, they didn't have to make an album either. If we're going to fall, you know, <laughs> if we're going to, if we're going to fall under that logic, like I think that it was totally cool, totally necessary. And um, and enhances the song. That's one of my favorite Living Sacrifice songs ever is Not Beneath. Um, I think that Inhabit is the pinnacle of this first iteration of Living Sacrifice um, where they figured it out. And it would have been interesting, honestly, to hear if they had stuck in this direction where they'd be at now. And my guess is that they would be like a tech death, a technical death metal band, like a Cryptopsy or something like something along those lines. You don't think they'd be non-existent if they followed down this route? I don't think they'd be non-existent, though. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I heard what you said. I just chose to not laugh. I got the cheap pop from Joe. There you go. Well, that's that's all that really matters then. Cheap pops right. for days. 1997 reborn. Oh my god. No, really, gentlemen. Uh-huh. Living sacrifice has arrived. This is the living sacrifice that most people will say is the album that got them into living sacrifice. Uh, there's no denying the influence that Reborn has and continues to still have. I mean, uh, much like the Zao reissues that happened, Living Sacrifice, uh, they had a limited uh, reissue of Reborn on vinyl. That thing sold out like it was made out of hotcakes. I mean, it was, I mean, it just, it just disappeared. Like, you just can't get one. Don't try to get one. You can't get one. You can get one, but you have to pay a lot of money for it. Um, Reborn, you have DJ has exited the band who was basically, you're not just losing a vocalist in that, but you're losing a band leader. DJ was the band. I mean, as far as um, he was, the, he was your, your typical front man in the sense that he kind of got the shows. You know, you like you, you joint manage the band slash sing for the band slash play bass for the band. So you're losing that in DJ's departure. No pun intended. So he's a, he's a Jason Wisdom. Kind of like a Jason Wisdom, yes. Uh, vocalist, bass player. Steve Rowe from Mortification, vocalist, bass player. Uh, it's just something about those guys. But uh, yeah, so you, you lose DJ and the band goes through kind of this weird period of like, what are we going to do? You know, because now you've got to find a new bass player, which they do. Um, and they find a new bass player, but then it's like, who's going to do vocals? And I think the hard decision there is... Do we find somebody new or do we promote from within? Evidently, they promoted from within. Whereas uh, Bruce Fitzhugh, uh, who played guitar for the band on all of the records that we just talked about, decided to, uh, 
or it, from what I understand, was a little bit pressured into it. Uh, <laughs> step up to the microphone. <laughs> And, um, you know, I think it would have been really easy to try to just do what DJ did to keep some consistency. Uh, but what they did, what, what you gained with Bruce was a hardcore scream, a hardcore influence that was desperately needed for a band in 1997. They, not they, he made the band sound infinitely more modern than they would have sounded necessarily on a band like, or on a record like Inhabit. I mean, it's not that ha Inhabit sounds dated, but it was kind of the older style of metal, the pre-metalcore, you know. And in 1997, it's not like metalcore was really an established genre. You had a few bands doing it, like uh, like Converge, you know. But for the most part, metalcore, especially in Christian music, pretty much unheard of. Uh, even at this time, Zeo was still playing kind of what they called like the spirit-filled hardcore. They was kind of a proto-metal, proto-metalcore sort of sound. They were playing metal riffs, but they had a guy screaming over it. Uh, so Living Sacrifice was like, okay, well, we're gonna continue being the metal band that we are, and we're, but we're gonna we're gonna throw some of this more hardcore stuff into it. So what you get is a band that is kind of more or less returned to their thrash roots, but the word roots is very important because there's a huge Sepultura influence that comes in on Reborn. It definitely has a different vibe. It definitely sets the standard for what I'm expecting when I listen to Living Sacrifice. And I hear pieces of what you're going to hear a lot more of when the name Rocky Gray is introduced, not just into this band, but into this scene. So whatever the chemistry is that makes this album sound like this, it's a sound that is going to continue onward into the next century and in some ways is definitely still here. You mentioned all the bands that cite Living Sacrifice as an influence. This is the album they talk about. If it's not this, it's the hammering process, which we're going to get into shortly. Yeah, I think for me, this is one where just straight out the gate, it's obvious this is a, a much better record. Um, I think they obviously, from the sounds of what Dan was saying, maybe he was pressured into it, but <laughs> this is one where they found a vocalist who maybe unbeknownst to them just fit what they were doing musically a lot better. Um, I don't think I can understate how this album is just leaps and bounds better than anything they put out thus far. It's almost like instead of having parts of a song, they learned how to really write full songs for this record and paid attention to the flow of a record, you know, I think when people talk about how great this band is, I would have I would have to assume this is the starting point for that conversation to be had. Um, I think some other things that I noticed about this record for me were that this is also one of the first albums where those weird stuttery off time rhythms that they were doing actually were locked in from a production standpoint and just didn't sound disjointed. Um, it's something, you know, we kind of joked about this a little bit ago uh, I with this band anyway. I feel like uh, No Longer, I feel like, has the same cadence as Slipknot uh, for Sick. But obviously, like, maybe Slipknot would have borrowed from this. Like, the cadence to it, I was like, huh, I recognize that. That's almost the same vocal cadence from Absolutely. Sick. Absolutely. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to beat the dead horse that we kind of all have in the fact that we like this record. It's a step up from the last one. But when people talk about living sacrifice and all the things I've heard people say to me, this is the first time where I'm like, OK, I can see it. I can hear it. I can understand why people like listening to this at times. I was like, oh, I see where Jesse from Killswitch got his vocal style. Yeah. Like there's obvious influences that I can hear in stuff I listened to that came after this. And I can go, I can I understand why before this. I didn't really have that feeling. Like, I was just kind of like, why does everyone like this band? Yeah, and I think the interesting thing, too, is that, like, they were more... I don't know, like, if you look at if you look at lyrics for a minute, um, I know a lot of people don't like to talk about lyrics with Christian bands, but um, DJ's lyrics were very biblical. Like, there was, there was always a... There was a lesson uh, in each song, you know, that was trying to, trying to teach you something, trying to Im implore some sort of idea on you. Um... But at the same time, when I'm reading through DJ's lyrics, I'm getting a lot of the biblical stuff, which 
I think was very important to him at the time, and it was his writing style. I mean, almost everything that DJ did rhymed, you know, and was like actually very, very well written, very well composed. Uh, Bruce's lyrics, on the other hand, are a little bit more straightforward. They're a little bit more in your face. Um, they're still, the, the band still has the same message, but they're telling it a little bit differently. Uh, but they have moments of just awesome on it where it's like stuff that you feel like a heavy, aggressive Christian band should have. Uh, like if you look at the song Liar at the very end, where it's like, I have seen, they played a, a sample, I've seen the devil and I have chained him. I cut him to pieces. Like it's, it, it's that sort of thing that really can get somebody that came from a religious background like I did, like really, really amped up. And then they play like what's essentially the heaviest song ever in Liar. Um, that's just like straight blast and then just ends it off with that clip of Lucifer is no more. And you like you're like, yeah, this is this is the kind of stuff that that this is the kind of stuff that Christian bands should do. Number one, to differentiate themselves from everybody else. And at the same time, also like really um really establish what their message is and and to keep it consistent with what it was in the past. They did all of that very, very masterfully on Reborn. Because this absolutely could have been an opportunity for them to be like, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna ease back on the religious elements and themes or whatever. But they just they decided to die on that hill. They were just like, yeah, we're we're, we're gonna stick with this. This is what we're all about. And um, I, and it's important that they did this on this record because this is what made them such a pillar in the Christian heavy music scene. This is the band that bands aspired to be after Reborn. Uh, this record, and then you you add this record coming out. And then you've got Zayo's Blood and Fire comes out right afterwards. And now it's not such a big mystery as to why every band that you heard in 2004 that was metalcore was a Christian band. All of that can be traced back to those two, to these two records. 2000, the hammering process. How do you follow up Reborn? You release the hammering process. I mean, the hammering process is... You know how I said that Reborn had a very big Sepultura influence? Uh, it's right out on display on the hammering process to the point where the band hired a separate percussionist uh, in order to add even more to the kind of more tribal style drumming uh, that was going on in Reborn. Now you've got that. The band actually slows down on the hammering process, which some people uh, seem to have had some issue with in the past, but those people are idiots. Um, <laughs> the, the, the pace of the hammering process is much slower. The riffs are heavier. The production is just astronomically better than anything that they've done before. And at this point, these guys are standing toe to toe with a lot of the bands that were popular in 2000, like your Slipknots and you know, Mudvanes. But the difference was is that they were not really new metal. There's a little bit in there. There is a little bit in there which I think really just comes from the sound of metal that year. Everybody was still trying to sound or capture what Sepultura did on Roots. And I think that they really um, they really lean into that hard. Bruce's vocal delivery is much stronger. And this is the first record where the band actually starts incorporating way more melody into the actual songs. And I'm not talking about what they did in the past where it's like, okay, this is the heavy part. Now we stop and we're gonna play this melodic thing. Uh, and then we're going to go back to the heavy again. This is actually like integrating melody into the actual songwriting and first appearance of any sort of like actually sung vocals on a living sacrifice record. Um, you know, I, I, I've written a lot of notes about this record. Um, I feel like the thing that's been impressive about this band is their ability to change with the current within the current metal landscape, uh, even at times being ahead of of it um this is clearly a step into that new metal realm as dan was talking about with songs like flatline but they put a solo in it and at the time that wasn't being done um you know and, and that's interesting when you're kind of seeing them following the the current landscape but still being true to themselves and doing things that weren't being done like at this point solos weren't a thing especially in new metal um they needed to be Right. And <laughs> I, I mean, I agree. But I think the thing is, too, and I know I said it on, on the other albums, but man, like, this is a band that I think really hits their stride when they slow down and stay in that mid tempo y area. Um, Altered Life, you know, one of the first examples of them bringing melody into into the vocals, as Dan kind of said. So that's 
you know, now a new welcomed addition to the band's ever evolving sound as we're, you know, a few records in. And I also still love that the band hasn't abandoned the things that made them them. Like, you know, I, I'm saying solos, but like they didn't abandon them when a lot of 80s bands were like, oh, the new thing is don't do solo. So fuck it. We're not going to or the bands that were coming out. You know, this is a very weird example, but I know for a fact that this person had said this. But Dan Donegan from Disturbed was like, I was a shredder, dude, like growing up when playing guitar. I always was into those people, but that wasn't what was cool in 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 style so i just hid that part of my playing and you know now there's solos on all the deserved fucking tracks because that's who he is as a player and i think that's something that's really interesting about this band is they are able to progress who they are still stay current with current bands but they're able to still keep what made them them and that's just such an interesting thing that i feel like a lot of bands of their era and of their caliber necessarily they dumbed everything down just to be more mainstream um as dan kind of touched on you know the tinges of latin percussions on songs like flatline and hand of the dead you know kind of usher in a different vibe um you know altered life also being another one where we get more melodic vocals so we're just kind of seeing this band nine years in and four albums in still able to be relevant if not innovators where a lot of their contemporaries of we'll just say 80s thrash didn't fucking do that and i think that should be a commended and b i think really adds to why they were able to stay relevant for as up until this point and beyond because they were willing to see that what they were doing might be dated but they figured out a way to bring it into current times and not make it feel dated i really don't know when the commercial side of metal made the decision that solos were a bad thing. Generally, it began around new metal, but people that knew how to play solos were still present. My favorite example is Kirk Hammett's comments on the Some Kind of Monster documentary. If you take the solos out, it dates it to this period. There was no reason why you should stop playing a solo as long as it fits with the song, but that was a decision that a lot of people made. It makes sense to me why Korn doesn't have a fucking shred solo. It also makes sense to me that many people were tired of the 80s style, we have to have a guitar solo after the second verse and shortly after the first bridge. It also makes sense that Living Sacrifice, who are innovators in this genre, who are present with other bands that would go on to define the genre, to many people, by the way, Dan, 2003, Dan called. He said, listen to Zayo. <laughs> You're following the influences into that Sepultura sound that everybody knows and loves with Roots because it was all about bringing the heavy, not necessarily tuning it down and making it discordant. It was still groovy. It was about the rhythm more than the song itself. So everybody cites Living Sacrifice for their influence and they still have the fucking balls to put a solo on an album in 2000 i mean all over that album you know and i think that like uh i think it's interesting how m how much better their songwriting actually has become over the years i mean reborn reborn was rock solid hammering process it's a whole new level not referencing pantera just by the way <laughs> um, but it is it's totally better like it's it's the sequencing on hammering process and the overall musicianship the the restraint that is actually shown on certain songs because i know these guys could just like shred our heads off in in, in a moment's notice but they don't do that as much. They they do stick to a little bit more of a mainstream songwriting kind of perspective. Like you look at like uh, the song Altered Life. It's very living sacrifice, but it is very verse, chorus, verse. And a lot of the times that's where I put on my critical hat and I go, oh, come on now, guys. Let's not resort to that. But I think in this in this case, it helps them. This is the most listenable Living Sacrifice album if you were a new listener. Because all the tracks flow, the album has a whole lot more dynamics. I love Reborn, but Reborn is just, it's not super dynamic. Um, not not like this. And so in, in, in 
looking at the hammering process as a record, it is actually one of the few records that I will throw out there and say is a perfect record because every song on it is enjoyable. There's no stinkers. There's no skips. And they deliver everything that they promised on the first track on every track. 2002, Conceived in Fire. Conceived in Fire is one of my favorite Living Sacrifice albums. They very much continue on in the same vein that they did in the hammering process. There's nothing too weird, but you do start seeing them pulling some of their older influences out. There's a little bit more death metal on this record, a little bit more thrash, a little bit more even a little bit of like black metal stuff with some of the vocals is thrown in there. Um, they, they want to be remembered as this metal band. And so they never, they always want to kind of stick to that aesthetic. And I think this record is probably the least amount of change between two records because you, you released a hammering process. So now you have to continually deliver something that is up to that level. And I do think that Conceived in Fire, it succeeds in that. I think that it is not quite as good as the hammering process, but that's just because they couldn't use hammering process songs on Conceived in Fire, right? <laughs> um, so, you, you know, you had to write a new album. But this, they actually double down on some of the catchiness of some of the vocal lines. Um, they actually they actually back up a little bit on some of the melodic singing. There's like one melodic vocal, and it's just a line. It's not a repeated chorus or anything, and that's just it. It's 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 another. It's a, to quote Joe, it's the next album by Living Sacrifice. Um, but one thing that I think is very notable about Conceived in Fire. Bruce's vocals are so much more intense than they've ever been. To me, this is the peak of his vocal ability. Absolutely. He's deeper. He has a lot more variation. Like, you go back and listen to Reborn, he just screams. You know, like, that's it. It's just one, one monotone scream throughout the entire record. Uh, and I love it. I think it sounds great. Uh, hammering process, he gets a little bit more diverse, uh, brings in, you know, uh, some of the other guys in the band kind of step up to the mic and do, you know, kind of their more clean vocals. Uh, and But Conceived in Fire is a Bruce record. It is Bruce from beginning to end. And um, he's deeper. He, sa- he just sounds like a beast, man. He- he's like super deep, sounds insanely pissed off. And um, I don't know, it just works really, really well. And I think my favorite song on Conceived in Fire is the song Ignite which is almost with it, it doubles down on the percre- on the percussive elements of the band in such a way that they almost start reaching like a mashuga level of technicality uh, with rhythm and I mean that's that's the first time that like I've ever been like whoa like this is this is them doing something that is actually like super innovative and something that other people are gonna latch on to and try to replicate. I mean, they definitely did that in 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 Reborn. Like, I I don't want to take away from what Reborn did, but this was the first time where I felt like the band was like moving forward. They weren't just sitting there, being okay with the success of Reborn and the hammering process. They were actually doing something really cool, and um, just that that whole song is just incredible. Right down to the the piercing solo that comes in, like at the end of it, like you, because like Mashuga wasn't like. You know, you wouldn't hear a solo like that on a Meshuggah song. So it, it comes across sounding like Meshuggah, but also like very living sacrifice. I think the thing that's interesting about this record is, you know, a song like Symbiotic just really brings back some of the older thrash elements uh, of the side of the band, especially, you know, with that solo in it. Um, I'm still just kind of really blown away by the extra percussion, which seems to at this point now be on full display. Um, you know, even as early as like the first couple of tracks and almost adds, you know, like Dan said on the last record, a little bit of that Sepultura Soulfly kind of vibe meets Sol- uh, Slipknot at times because I feel like I hear like a keg or something like not a straight Latin percussion, but something a little bit more, I guess, straight ahead. Um, this might be honestly just one of the, the few bands, like I said, that try something on a previous record and then really just into finds a way to integrate it more into what they're doing on the, the next release. And it's just really refreshing, uh, especially in, in a genre and scene uh, that's evolving at this point, you know, on Conceived in Fire at this in this era of metalcore and so forth um, that really you're just not used to seeing or hearing. And I, I can't understate that enough. Um, you know, a lot of times where we as fans are like, 
we're so fickle um, where if you don't do anything, all we go is, oh, fuck, you're, just, you're not changing. But then if you right. do too much, wow, well, fuck, you're doing too much. And <laughs> there's there doesn't seem to be that middle ground that we as fans will appreciate where we're like, OK, you grew enough, but you didn't venture too far out of what I want you to do. And this is a band that I feel has done a very good job of straddling that very thin line that we as fans uh, often put bands into while not making it feel like a contrived effort either. And that, you know, like I said, it's something I'm going to keep kind of keep talk, talking on and as a talking point. But I, it's just really interesting to see a band that started off as an 80s kind of thrash band be able to progress and stay current with the, the current metal quote unquote metal scene and it not feel forced or fake. And that's we can name so many bands in this era of, of this time that tried doing that shit and it just does not fucking work. And what they do on this record is that Sepultura influenced sound taken where it needed to go logically next. You're still rhythmic. You're still pushing the boundaries when it comes to independent metal bands who are Christian in nature. This could easily be one of the heaviest records for anyone in 2002, but not everybody was listening to it. That's unfortunate because now everyone does listen to it because we've passed that point, at least most people have, where I can't listen to that if it's a Christian band or I won't listen to it if it's not a Christian band. I think 2020, we can just listen to the record for what it is. The only thing that would make this sound different if this band were mainstream in 2002, it would have had a different sound of producer's polish on it. It sounds to me like what every independent metal record sounded like in 2002, and that was far above and beyond what other records sounded like at that time. <laughs> so I had no idea that Andy Sneap actually produced this record. I found that out like literally the other day when I was ripping the CD. Surprise. And I was just kind of Yeah, I was just kind of looking in the in the liner notes. That was, that was a huge surprise. But uh yeah, like and this is a really interesting part of Living Sacrifice's history in that they were one of the biggest Christian metalcore bands to exist in 2002. They were like the go-to band Except for, like, Zayo, but, like, Zayo was having problems at that time. And so, like, there wasn't the unified scene that there is now. And so I think what's fascinating about this era is that they still can't quite get popular to make it. They're going, they're going to, um, they're going to, they're going to shows and these kids are walking up to them and they're like, dude, your new record stands toe to toe with like Soulfly and Slipknot and like all these bands. Like you guys are every bit as good as those bands. And so I don't understand why you're not on bigger tours or whatever. And it's like, well, they're on solid state and they're still playing Christian shows and they're still, you know, because that's the scene that's there to support them. But like how many, how many church goers are really going to go see a metal show that's that brutal you know um it's it's such a fine line to walk and it's it's such a shame too because they they actually did end up breaking up during this period and they were just gone for a number of years because 2002 it just wasn't quite enough but the the heartbreaking thing was is that like if they had just held on a little bit longer that scene literally like living sacrifice breaks up and then as I lay dying puts out a record called frail words collapse and suddenly Christian metalcore is like mainstream, at least in the, in the vein of like heavier music. Um, if they had held on long enough, I remember reading social media posts from as I lay dying, they were super stoked to play their new frail words collapse songs in front of living sacrifice fans. Like that's literally what they said. Like, like we can't wait for the living sacrifice fans to hear what we've got going on over here. Um, and that's just that's just completely mind blowing for me that if they had just held on long enough, they might have been remembered like an Azalea dying. Because that's the dream. Even if your yeah. scene isn't the mainstream, if you hold on just long enough, eventually everyone's going to catch on and everyone's going to get it. But they'd had enough, man. They'd been they'd been in the game since 1990. It had been They'd a been long doing time. this thing that they're doing since 1990. So, when you're this, when you when you put out this many great records in a row, and you're still not really getting the recognition, and I don't think it was like about the recognition for the band or the money, but like, 
if you're putting this much time and effort in it and doing it at this professional of a level, but you're still so you're still self funding a lot of that. I don't blame them at all. It's just that now I have the I have the uh, I've got the hindsight to be like, oh man, if you guys could have could have grinded it out until like 2003, 2004, you guys probably would have gotten on a bigger label. You know, you probably would have gotten you know a lot more press, and it would have been it would have been awesome for you. Uh, but they didn't, and they decided to break up, and that's when bands like Demon Hunter started coming out, and bands like. Asley dying and Under Oath got got more popular, and then suddenly you had like this whole brand new like a second wave of Christian metalcore, which ultimately ended up going on to tons and tons of success. Um, and that was kind of it for Living Sacrifice for a long time. They put out a record called In Memoriam, uh, which was just like their final release. Which actually, the the interesting thing about In Memoriam is that there is three brand new songs. And I don't know if they were leftovers, um, but they're actually like really good living sacrifice songs. They sound um, very similar to like a hammering process conceived in fire type of sound. And uh, Buddy and I used to actually do a radio show and we played those songs all the time in the regular rotation. Um, and yeah, it was it was good. It, it had those three songs. And one of my favorite songs off In Memoriam is the re-record of Enthroned uh, from Non-Existent. They re-recorded a Non-Existent track with the modern lineup. And oh my God, like if they had recorded the entire, re-recorded the entire Non-Existent album with that lineup, I mean, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. We'd be like, yep, Non-Existent, the re-record, best album ever made. You know, like, <laughs> like hands down. Uh, Bruce just brings something to that track and the ferocity of the band with all their modern influences, bringing it to bear on that old song. Uh, yeah, in Throne 98 is incredible. And that song actually, I think, was on a compila- a solid state compilation uh, several years before. So they threw it in as kind of an extra. But I mean, and that was pretty much it. That was crickets. Just straight crickets. 2010, The Infinite Order. So the, uh, the bros and Demon Hunter had spent many, many years trying to um, essentially fill that void. Like there were bands that came out in the Christian scene in those in-between years that kind of were, I mean, and maybe this is just imagined as a fan, but it almost seemed like they were trying to fill that void uh, that Living Sacrifice left because Christian metal was always missing that, that legit metal band that had legit metal influences, you know, from the secular scene that would play solos in the 2010s or, you know, play solos in... 2005, 2006, and they, people got burned out eventually on the Asley Dying, Gothenburg, death metal type sound. Um, so everybody wanted that like American metal band, Christian. Everybody wanted Living Sacrifice, is what they wanted. So you got bands that kind of tried to fill that void. You had Demon Hunter, but Demon Hunter just leaned so heavily into the mainstream rock and, and new metal territory uh, that people that were big fans of Living Sacrifice's heavier stuff were like, nah. And that, that's not really for me. And then you had bands like The Showdown, uh, which, you know, definitely sounded different from Living Sacrifice, but had kind of that same vibe, you know. And then um, you had Becoming the Archetype uh, was probably the closest you could get. But eventually, I think that enough people convinced uh, the guys in Living Sacrifice that, like, if you guys came back now, like, you would do better. You know, you, you would do better. And, you know, you don't have to come back full time. We, we live in a world now where you guys don't have to tour full-time. I mean, Demon Hunter still doesn't tour full-time. You know, they literally are a band that works their jobs, and um, they'll do, like, a tour in the summer, and that's it. And so, eventually, Living Sacrifice, they, they reignited the fire, and they released a two-song, like, EP called um, Death Machine, which had two songs, Death Machine and The Battle. Uh, and I remember being super, super stoked for those songs, and then they're like, okay, now that we now that we've made a little bit of like iTunes sales, you know, on this, uh, we'll go ahead and record a new record. And what we got was the Infinite Order. Generally, the sound of Living Sacrifice from 2000 to present day is credited to Rocky Gray's influence. I don't know if that is 100 percent true. Or if Rocky Gray's style just generally leans in that direction we've been discussing. But a lot of what you hear on these newer records, The Infinite Order, and going back to Conceived in Fire, you've heard similar sounding riffs 
in Soul Embraced for years. Oh, yeah. I don't care whose fault it is, but I remember how much hype there was in 2010 when this album was about to come out. All I heard was, you remember when Living Sacrifice broke up a few years ago? Well, they're coming back. And everyone was excited. Everybody was talking about the band again. They were one of the bands that influenced everybody, and they left just too early. So imagine how excited we were to hear that Living Sacrifice is coming back, and they have new music, and they're a band again. 2010 was a great year. They're a band you can go see again. You know, um, hasn't been that way, you know, obviously recently, but like they were a band that you could that you could catch on a show and you could catch on a tour. And um, the Infinite Order is an interesting record because I would say it's probably the safest living sacrifice record um, that they could have put out. And don't get me wrong, I'm criticizing it for being safe, but it's super smart, super smart to, to you know, oh, hey, guys, we're back. You remember those records you love hammering process and conceived and fire? This record's kind of like those, except um, not so much on the on the additional percussion. Uh, we don't really have that going on in, in the sound anymore. Um, this record, while still capitalizing on the metalcore uh, sort of sound that they had established on the last two records, uh, they kind of take that and they put it into a format where they're playing songs that you would expect Living Sacrifice to play. Um, I mean... I don't know. This is a hard one for me because as much as I like the record, I think it's a really great standalone record to listen to. If you listen to it and you like Living Sacrifice, you're not going to have a bad time. Uh, But I do think that The Infinite Order doesn't necessarily have as compelling of material on it uh, as we'd had on the previous two records. And that's so hard because it's so many years later. And obviously they just kind of had to get the they had to get the chops going again. I mean, that's just that's just my opinion. I think the record sounds good. I think Bruce sounds good. I think they actually still do sound like a young band, which is admirable considering how long of a how long they've been a band. Um, but yeah, I think they do some interesting things on this record. Uh, the last two tracks being like kind of a slower paced, like kind of dirgier songs, like focusing more on that like slow, heavy sound. Um, and they pull a lot of their thrash from the past into some of these song structures. Um, Rules of Engagement, I think, is probably my favorite song on the record. Um, Nietzsche's Madness is good. Um, you know, like I said, it's not its not that this record doesn't have bangers on it. It does. Uh, but for whatever reason, it just didn't hit me the same way Conceived in Fire did, which could also just go back to that age-old, I'm sorry, we can't make you feel the way you felt in 2003. Yeah, what's... <laughs> What's interesting about this is like, you know, how I said previously how this band has done a really good job of blending its whole catalog up to this point. You know, I feel like this was them going trying to go more back to the thrash roots that, you know, they kind of came from. And maybe a lot of older fans were wanting. I don't know if fans wanted that, but still adding what was becoming now modern metalcore. Um, you know, at this point, it's 2010, so metalcore, Christian metalcore especially, is is huge. Um, you know, obviously, they're on one of the bigger labels uh, of that, that style, uh, basically in solid state. Um, I kept asking myself this question when listening to this record, especially given the fact that they were basically on a quote-unquote eight-year hiatus or whatever. I still don't know if these guys are innovating a sound and, and or style or just doing a very great job of integrating what's popular within that sound while still somehow not making it feel contrived. I think the lack of contrived is an indicator that it's them. It's not, this is popular, let's do this. I think that they have a specific way of putting things together that is unique to this band. I can't think of another band that does not have Rocky Gray in it that can put together this style of metal or metal core. Everybody else was trying to throw in extra guitars and three different parts and have more orchestrations than the band is physically capable of pulling off live. Living Sacrifices just were heavy. And melodic, though. I mean, Infinite Order has some of the most melodic material they've ever put out. But like John said, it's not done in a contrived way. At no point during Infinite Order does it 
everything fade out and you just hear a hey! like it just doesn't do that. And even <laughs> even whenever even whenever they did do that on the hammering process, it still wasn't that. You know, like it for whatever reason it, it still blended in such a way that it was okay. Like it, it it just brush over you. If you're not into clean vocals, it's fine because they're not shoving them down your throat. Um, and so metal fans are going to be totally fine with that. Um, I do think that the Infinite Order could benefit from being a little bit more fast paced, a little bit more immediate than it is. But I mean, the second half of the record really kind of slows down. The top half is much more engaging. Uh, no pun intended. But uh, yeah, Infinite Order, it was a fine release for Living Sacrifice. I'd rather have it than not have it, <laughs> I guess, if, if that's the way you want to look at it. But, um, you know, yeah, it was a very safe record for them. It was it was good. It was uh, it got them kind of back in the uh, in the good graces, I guess, of the of the Christian music scene. Um, but then, you know, again, uh, they weren't really doing it full time. So it was a little while before we got another record. 2013 ghost thief i'm gonna go ahead and just say probably the unpopular opinion on this um this just to me sounds like a rather straightforward i'll say it uninspired um especially given you know the infinite order and conceived on fire it's conceived in fire um this just to me feels like a very safe kind of paint by numbers living sacrifice record it's not great it's not terrible it just kind of is, and given what we got on the Infinite Order, I feel like it was a pretty big letdown for me. Yeah, I mean, that that is how I initially did feel about it, um, and I felt that way actually up until this week whenever we went back and listened to everything. Again, I found a lot more like about Ghost Thief, but I can't argue with that it is kind of paint by numbers, and for the, whatever reason, it actually sounds a lot thinner. Like, the sound doesn't sound as full on, on Ghost Thief as it did even on the Infinite Order, and definitely not like the same level as Hammering Process or uh, Conceived in Fire. I think it's still. I think the songs are still good, but it's almost just like it's almost like somebody just came to a band meeting and was like, "Well, we've got ten songs, or we've got twelve songs, or whatever." You know, like so. Let's go ahead and do the thing that we do, and we'll record them and, and put them out. Um, I don't think Ghost Thief is bad by any stretch of the imagination. I think they are beyond at this point putting out a bad record. They don't have the you know, they're never going to put out like another something like non-existent or, <laughs> you know, something something that you're just going to it's going to be so far from what you're expecting. Um, but I also think that that is safe and that, you know, if this is providing any sort of supplemental income for the band, it is good to put out a record that the fans are going to like. And there are some good songs on Ghost Thief. It's just that, like, this could also be a, be the result of me just getting older. And when I listen to Living Sacrifice, there's specific songs that I want to hear. And an album of an album of new material may not necessarily ever be able to quench that. Like, I want to believe that, like, it, they could put out something that could be mind blowing, and I would immediately love it. But I don't know if I would, you know. So if Ghost Thief is more expertly composed than anything else that they've ever done, my mis- my nostalgia for the band and their classic records you know would would still make me be like oh yeah i mean it's all right you know i don't know this could be a me thing i i've been trying to figure out for years why i don't like ghost thief as much as i feel like i should um and i think it just boils down to the fact that like it's just not um like john said it's not necessarily as uh inspired it's just kind of like yeah we have these songs we we hope you guys like them and maybe it doesn't actually need to be more than that you know, maybe maybe it's it maybe it's just totally fine, but um, you know, I'm still gonna buy whatever the next Living Sacrifice release is. You know, um, I'm still gonna go see the band anytime I'm able to go see them. So I mean, in that regard, I think they've they've succeeded overall as a band. Even if you put a record on that I'm not that I'm not super stoked on, um, you didn't put a bad record out that pissed me off. <laughs> you know, so. I mean, they're they're this many years in now, almost thirty years, more than thirty years, and uh, they're still doing pretty well, which is which is more than I can say for a lot of bands their age. <laughs> John's got something brewing in his head. No, I mean, the thing that's interesting, you know, just as a whole, like I said, you know, you, you guys are 
kind of challenging me with some of the bands uh, that we're going to be talking about this year. You know, I'm actually I actually was pulling up the uh, the master list just to kind of take a look at how many bands I don't fucking know uh, and have never really outside of maybe a song or two have ever listened to. And it's one of those things where, you know, when I realized I had two weeks, really only for me, about a week. Uh, Because I went to Vegas for about five days uh, for my anniversary. So I basically crammed living this this discography as well as what we're talking about next week um, into about a week. And it was really interesting to just see the parallels between the two, even though they couldn't have been a more stark contrast as far as two different bands going. But that's kind of the interesting thing about some of this sometimes when doing these is you're like, oh, there's actually a lot more similarities between bands that are polar opposites of each other than you think. And sometimes it takes doing something like this to kind of realize that. And I'm kind of glad, you know, like, because now at least, you know, Living Sacrifice is one of those bands for a lot of the bands that I like, you know, like I said earlier, I could hear where Jesse's vocal style uh, came from, from Kill Switch Engage. Um, you know, on the band we're talking about next week, I can hear the influences that they've had on hardcore bands that I listen to um, and even some punk bands and so forth. So it's just kind of interesting to go back and knowing that I've never listened to these things, but I'm able to listen to it with the 2020 years, basically, and knowing the, the bands and people that have cited these people as influences for a very long time and finally hearing those influences shining through. And it may not necessarily be something that I'm going to go back and listen to all the time, but at least I have the appreciation and understanding now. And I think that's something that this show has always kind of strived to do is maybe be the conduit for you may like XYZ mainstream band or, you know, quote unquote mainstream. We'll say like a band like Killswitch is mainstream to us. Um, but it, it you wouldn't maybe have them without a living sacrifice. You wouldn't have them without, you know, a shadow's fall, without aftershock, without, you know, a lot of these bands that sometimes Dan and Joe and, and Jeff and whomever else before have talked about. So I'm interested and excited to kind of be a part of this and kind of learn more a little bit about some of my history with some of these bands um, and how they've influenced bands that I really enjoy, while also maybe being the voice for the fans that listen to this show and go, I've never listened to this band, but now I'm intrigued. And I hope that's what people get out of it. <laughs> For sure. I don't think Living Sacrifice in 2013 needs to write the next big metalcore record. I think Ghost Thief is another album of songs. They've already written your favorite album, and they're going to play the songs live. Is this a letdown? I don't think so. I think it's just the band... Having gone away, having done enough, at least in their eyes, that they're just doing what they want. And at the end of the day, you can still go see the band play the songs from the hammering process live. So, yeah, it's a little par for the course, but it's not the worst album I've heard. And it's definitely not the worst album in their discography. <laughs> no. <laughs> nope, there's there's one that stands out to me. Holy yeah. shit, yeah. And I wish it was non-existent. <laughs> oh, no. Final thoughts on Living Sacrifice. Dan. I mean, what else is there to say? Living Sacrifice is a classic band that you should be listening to. Um, if the Christian thing bothers you, I'm sorry. But, I mean, that just is what the band is. Um, and they are one of the best metal bands that you're going to hear that has had this long of a career that you've not heard of, probably. Um, but if you have and you're in the know, then you... There's nothing I'm going to say that, that that's going to be able to add to what your appreciation is for this band. They mean a lot to me. I still listen to them very regularly. And if you haven't checked out Living Sacrifice, I mean, seriously, like they're the band that you they're 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 the band that you've never heard that is going to make you appreciate innovation that you didn't even know was there. It's like what John says, like a lot of your favorite bands that you listen to have probably been influenced by Living Sacrifice to some degree. John, what about you? I mean, I think I kind of indirectly already said it before we were officially doing the the final thoughts, so um, I feel like anything else I would say or add on to what Dan just said would kind of be beating the dead horse, so I'm just going to leave it at that. I think Living Sacrifice is one of the most influential bands in the metalcore scene. Whether or not your band started as a Christian band is still a Christian band or decided that they were going to no longer be a Christian band because 
you ran out of ways to say the same thing and write new riffs with it. Living Sacrifice is still the band that got you where you are today. They put it all together. They gave you the formula. And the formula really is just Sepultura. And isn't that already the new metal formula? So how did we go from that to metalcore? It's interesting. I like listening to the band. I like listening to the early albums because they remind me that the members of this band are not only influenced by that solid metalcore sound, but there was a time where all they wanted to do was just be Slayer. Yeah, we've all been there. How you're not listening to Living Sacrifice in 2021, I don't know, but you have definitely heard Living Sacrifice in your favorite band. So you need to be listening to Living Sacrifice. John, what's your album of the week? Uh, it's going to be Golden Age Grotesque by Marilyn Manson. Good call. Dan, what about you? Uh, well, I just got this record recently, a uh, local pickup uh, by The Burial. It's called Lights and Perfections, uh, and I've really been digging it. Based on record band that I probably should have been paying more attention to, but just didn't up until now. So, uh, yeah, I'm all about I'm all about The Burial this week. What about after it? No, we did that already. Oh. <laughs> For me, it's March or Die by Motorhead. R.I.P. See you in the future, Lemmy. One of these days, we'll do a Motorhead episode. I might have I, to maybe. override the schedule and just put it on there myself. Oh, no. Nobody overrides the schedule. Take us out, DFT. If you've ever been listening to our podcast and you would like to recommend us a band to talk about on the show, we are very open to that. Uh, you can send us messages or get a hold of us in any way that you see fit. But uh, here's a couple of ways to get you started. You can send us an email at show at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. You can follow us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Discography Discussion. You can follow us on Instagram at Discuss Metal. Uh, you can go to our sweet, sweet Teespring store that has all kinds of Discography Discussion merch on it. There'll be a link in our show notes that'll take you right there. Also in our show notes will be a link to our Discord server, which is a live chat service where you can hang out with us, talk to some other listeners of the show, and just enjoy yourself. If there's an awesome pool, you should check out the pool. If you like watching the episodes live or you just like to hear my voice while I play some video games, you can find us on our Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash DiscussMetalDan or twitch.discussmetal.com uh, for all of your live streaming needs. We also do Brutally Speaking over there, John and I. So uh, definitely check that out. And uh, guys, this has been a great, uh, this has been a great fun live stream. I love being able to let people in on how we don't take ourselves nearly as seriously as maybe we seem like we do on the edited shows. And on that note, this has been episode 204 of Discography Discussion. Thank you for listening. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts, including Google Play, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things discography discussion. And please send questions and comments to Dan and Joe Show at gmail.com. If you are not a patron, you can become one at patreon.com forward slash Discuss Metal. We have some sweet perks. Give me your whiskey. I've got these 50 cents here. Can we use them for anything? You can put it toward my whiskey fund. Let's do it. How much for that whiskey? One dollar a month gets you into that exclusive album review feed. Yeah, all these guys showing off their whiskeys. No, you, you, guys, have, you guys have seen that SNL Drinky Crow skit, right? <laughs> I don't think I have, actually. How much for that whiskey? That whiskey there? That's a dollar. Dollar.